What's going on, Renaissance? My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here. So grateful that you have tuned in with us for our online service. Before we get started in today's message, I want to pray for us. So Heavenly Father, I pray that right now you would meet us and you would be God with us in this moment and speak to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So growing up, uh, I, every single year, my family and I go to Buffalo Junction, Virginia. It is way off the grid. Cell phones don't work there, at least T-Mobile doesn't. And I've gone literally every single year of my life, except for this last one because of the pandemic. Now in the family reunion, it is just like a normal family reunion. We got spades going. I'm nice, don't you, y'all don't want no parts of me on the spades table. Uh, I got family members with jerry curls, fried chicken, everything, bouncy castles. It was always a phenomenal time. But as a kid, there was one part of it that I always hated. It was when we had to come back inside and listen to one of my cousins give our family history. Now, when I was a child, I didn't really pay attention to any of it. I just kind of tuned out and waited for it to be over so we can go back to playing games. But as I got older, I started listening and paying attention to it. And as I heard our history, it was like something just a, like a light bulb went off in my head and I started to understand myself a whole lot more in light of my family's history. See, years ago, uh, there was a man named George Wharton. And George Wharton was black, but he was extremely light-skinned and was passing for white. And George Wharton bought about a thousand acres of land in Buffalo Junction, Virginia, and gave it to a bunch of families there. Uh, he gave some to my great-grandfather, and as a result, my, my family, they didn't have to be sharecroppers they were able to farm their own land and they didn't have to get into any of those predatory deals that so many people were, were in in the South. And as a result, my family was truly able to thrive and that entire community was able to thrive. So much so that they built schools, they built churches, they built so many things because they had their own wealth. On my mother's side of my family, uh, I'm a fifth generation college graduate. My great, great grandmother was in the second class ever at Hampton University. And the more I heard the stories of where I came from, it made so much sense of where I am today. Now, why do I say all of this? Because we're about to go back into our own ancestry and go back to our spiritual forefathers and foremothers in this book of Exodus. And Exodus is a phenomenal book. And I would even go so far as to say that if you do not understand Exodus, it's almost impossible to understand Jesus in the Bible because so much of Jesus's teachings, the apostles' teachings, they're all based on this one book. There's so many themes and there's so many wonderful teachings that Exodus gives us. So I'm, I'm really excited that for the next number of months, we're gonna be in this book of, of Exodus for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, when we look at Exodus and take a hard look at it, we'll get a, a much better understanding of the things that plague us on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's gonna make some stuff a whole lot more clear about your faith and about my faith, uh, how we are to live as people. Uh, it gives us so many different tools. And, and two, if I'm being perfectly honest, um, one of the things that keeps me up at night is whether or not our people are truly being formed into real followers of Jesus, like genuine followers of Jesus. I worry, do you, do you know enough? Do we, do we know enough? Have we, are, we loving God's with, 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 are we loving God with our minds? And one of the things that I was so excited about with Exodus is how much Exodus is gonna connect the dots for so many people. And that these are not just stories and folk legends. These are real events that happened in the people of God's life. And it's gonna shed so much light on who we are and what God wants us to be and what it means to be in real relationship with him. So I am extremely excited uh, for that. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating is that when Jesus talked about who he was, he talked about himself in relationship to this book as well. There's a passage of scripture where right after Jesus was crucified, he is talking to two people and he's risen from the dead and he's talking to people. And it, it says in the scripture that Jesus, when he's explaining the crucifixion, when he's explaining his life, why he came, he starts with Moses and this book of, of Exodus and all the prophets and explains to them all the things about himself that you see in these scriptures. So we're going to see a whole lot about Jesus uh, in Exodus. We're going to see a whole lot about what it means to be people 
our shortcomings, our, our failures, and what it means to be in relationship uh, with God. So there's, uh, for today, I want to give us an overview. I want to just put some pillars down for us to understand what Exodus is, what it means, what we're going to be going through. And I know none of you will ever miss a week in the series. You're going to be with us every single Sunday, t- tuned in at eight o'clock in the morning. You're not going to miss any weeks. But just in case you were to miss a week, uh, I wouldn't want you to miss out on the major themes that uh, we're going to establish today. So today, I want to zoom out a little bit on this major and amazing piece of art, this, this, this work, God's word to us, to give us some pillars about what are the major themes in Exodus. And then going forward, we're going to drill down specifically into each one of these for the next number of months. And we're going to dig out so many jewels from this book. And the first theme is this. The first theme is one that I need now. And it's one that you need now. It's this, that God keeps his promises. You've heard me say this before. You've heard it from someone else before. You've heard it in a song. Your grandmother might have told you this. But we're going to see upfront and personal what it means that God keeps his promises. And we're going to live in this tension of having aspirations in life that are still not fulfilled. How do we live in this tension where we have desires that have not yet been met? Uh, cries for justice that seem to be falling on deaf ears. Well, you and I are not alone. And the good news for us is that God keeps his promises. In Exodus 2, when we first see God arrive on the scene, it says in verse 24 that God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites and God knew. Now, what's going on here in this text uh, is dropping a bunch of names that were introduced to us in the book of Genesis. And these were people that God made a promise to. God made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he was going to bless the entire world through them. And they found themselves in slavery in Egypt. And it just felt like God forgot or that God was absent or that God was powerless. Now, in Exodus 2, when God arrives, he reminds them that he is good to his promises. He heard their cries and he was with them. Now, what we're going to find as we read through the book of Exodus is something that all of us need. All of us need for today. All of us need the assurance that God hears our cries, our prayers, and that God is a promise answering God. Without it, you'll be tempted to take things into your own hand, as I am so many times. Now, the reason that we need to know this is because, uh, like my boy John Onwacheka at Cornerstone Church in Atlanta says it, uh, when it comes to making sense of God's work in your life, you make a better historian than you do a detective. Historians reflect on the past to help make sense of present circumstances. Detectives solve mysteries. God works in mysterious ways and you ain't Sherlock Holmes. Now, why is this so important? You and I need to be historians and this is one of the reasons I'm really excited about Exodus is to see God's faithfulness and to see how God has answered his promises to give us hope to keep on trusting even when we don't see that what we want from God right directly in our faces. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he was lamenting about some stuff going on in his life. And I said, you know what, bro? Right now is an opportunity for you to trust God just because God said that he's trustworthy. And for some of you, you're in that place right now. God calls you to trust him just because he says that he is trustworthy. And from Exodus, we're going to find all of these jewels and all of these nuggets to see God's faithfulness, how God keeps his promises through the ages to give us hope. And all of us need hope. I was reading a story about a little town in Maine called Flagstaff, Maine. And uh, this one author by the name of Halford Luckick wrote about this in one of his books called Unfinished Business. And it was a really peculiar situation. In this town of Flagstaff, Maine, it was a pretty small town and the, the state decided that they were gonna flood the town to make a lake to provide for a dam that was gonna happen. What was peculiar was that uh, many months before the, the, the town was to be flooded, everything just kind of went to ruin. Nobody painted anything. Nobody kept up any roads. Everything was just really uh, fading pretty quickly. And here's what he noted in his book about uh, why people basically gave up uh, any desire to do anything in that town. He says this, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. When there is no faith in the future that things will get better, 
There's no power in the present. A lot of us lack power today in our faith, in our prayer, because we just lost faith in our future, that something good was going to happen in our lives, that God is paying attention, and we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness, and we're going to see this over and over again in, in Exodus. Now, the second theme that you're going to see all up and down the book of Exodus is this, that God himself provides true freedom. What do you think of when you think about the concept or the word freedom? What we're going to see as we look at specific texts in chapters 1 through 15 is that God himself provides freedom. Now, there's some pretty interesting things in those chapters. There's all these plagues that maybe pre-pandemic, you wouldn't have understood them that much. They might hit a little different now. Uh, but God himself, out of all of this mess, out of all of this hard-heartedness, out of all of this difficulty, it is God himself who brings freedom, not us. Now, in Exodus 3, it says it as much. It says, then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. So God's people were in slavery for over 400 years. And it says, and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings and highlight this, uh, underline this in your Bibles. And I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this is a dangerous thing, which I'm about to recommend to you. But for this text and probably this text only, I want you to imagine yourself in this one that God has come to rescue you from the power of what? Who is your Egyptian? Where is the land that God wants to bring you to? What are the promises that God wants to bring in your life? Now, this is a challenge for me because so often, certainly early on in my walk with God, and still sometimes today, I kind of feel like God is a, the type of God who gives us a list of things to do, stands back and says, when you're done with it, then come holler at me. I, I, I like Jesus being my consultant, and my, and my, and the one who gives me all of the things to do, but I don't always see myself in need of a savior or even that there's a savior accessible to me. But here's what we see in the scripture. Here's what we see all up and down the book of Exodus. His name is Yahweh. He is the God who saves in your life. Don't stop praying. Go to him. And our goal is to push ourselves to make ourselves available to God and to this community to go after the freedom that God brings. Secondly, the second misunderstanding I've had about freedom was that I used to think that God wanted us, God wanted to liberate me just for the sake of liberating me. So if I struggled with being a people pleaser, I thought that God wanted me to stop being a people pleaser because that's a bad thing to be. And make no mistake about it, it is a bad thing to be. But the freedom that God brings is not just for freedom's sake. As it says over and over again in the text, if you'll see it, if, if you've read this, this book of Exodus before, if you've heard the um, Charlton Heston, you know, uh, Exodus story when he played Moses, if you've watched American Idol when the guy sang, let my people go, uh, it never says, let my people go in the Bible. It doesn't say that. It says, let my people go so that they can worship me. Over and over again, about nine or 10 times, it never says that God wanted them just to be free from Pharaoh. It says, let them go so that they can worship me. What we see in that is that true freedom is not just an absence of obstacles or things in our way or, or freedom from our Egyptians. It's a freedom to be in relationship with God. Over and over again in Exodus, we see that God draws his people out just to draw them in to a relationship with him. Now, years ago, in 2013, a documentary came out about SeaWorld and the captivity and the harsh treatment of these killer whales. And so much was made up of that. But obviously, make no mistake about it, whales were never meant to be kept in, uh, in captivity. And none of these big, beautiful animals were. However, it wouldn't be freeing the animal if you took a killer whale, an orca, and put them on two-fifth. They would only be free where they were naturally designed to be. What we see in the scripture is that when God talks about our freedom, it's not just a freedom from, it's a freedom for. It's a purpose that God wants to free us to be in relationship with him, to worship him uh, without guilt and with no reservation. G.K. Chesterton is a pastor, an old pastor. He says like this, do not free a camel of the burden of his hump. You may be freeing him from being a camel. What does that mean for us? You and I were created not just to be free in general, but to be in relationship with God. We were made to orient our lives around God and to worship him. And yo, check this out. One thing that I've seen in my own life 
is that sometimes the biggest obstacles that God needs to free me from are not external. It's not my kids. It's not online kindergarten. It's not this pandemic. It's me. One thing that you'll see in the book of Exodus is that the first 14 chapters cover a number of weeks where God shows up and he frees the children of Israel from the mighty hand of the Egyptian and God shows up and he flexes and it's a beautiful thing to see God free his people. They walk through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. God is mighty in how he delivers them from the Egyptians. But for the next 40 years, they wander around facing a different enemy. It wasn't external, it was internal. It was them themselves. When God talks about them in, Genesis, in Exodus 32, excuse me, this is how God talks about his people, the children of Israel. And a lot of parents, you would understand this. It says, the Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people and they are indeed a stiff necked people. Stiff necked was another word for stubborn, non-compliant. Their biggest enemy was not external, it was internal. Now, one of the ways I've been thinking about this this past week is uh, a lot of us have had some family member or a friend who has been impacted by cancer. And I, I absolutely hate cancer. I lost my late wife to angiosarcoma, which is a sarcoma. And one of the things that I've learned in my years of working with different cancer organizations is that the cancers that are like visible, you actually have a decent chance against those. And, uh, uh, sarcomas can appear anywhere on the body, on your scalp, on your arm, on your skin, some on your breast, or sometimes on an internal organ. And the ones that you can see, there's a lot of survivors, people who have lived full, um, incre incredible lives where they had a small bump in the road and have gone on to live long, full lives. But the ones that you can't see, the ones that show up in places and crevices that multiply and replicate without visibility, those are the ones that are really, really deadly. My late wife had hers on her heart. And by the time they found it, it was certainly too late to do anything about it. Now, what's true for your body is also true for your soul. It's not the things that you can see sometimes. It's not the enemy that you can see. Sometimes it's the internal things that we can't see. The dangerous, invisible things are the ones that oftentimes are to our ruin. The things that they could not see in the book of Exodus, they couldn't see their doubt. The thing that made them question whether or not they can take God at his word. It's invisible, it's invisible, but it's dangerous and it corrodes our soul. Dangers like complaining and how contagious it is and how dangerous it is, not just to ourselves, but also to this entire community. The danger of idolatry, of building our lives around something, of trusting something other than God. These are the real things that can trip you up. My biggest danger right now is not uh, an external force, though they are real and, and for real. My biggest danger is Jordan building his life around something other than God. And God shows us in this, in this in the scripture that the real freedom that he has come to bring to us sometimes is freedom from us. Now, uh, the, uh, the third theme that we see in Exodus is a powerful one. And it's one that some of you a lot of you actually are gonna misunderstand at first, and it's this concept of what is the relationship between us and God and all of these rules that God has. If you read through the book of Exodus, you'll certainly see all of these rules and these laws. And there's a couple of camps of people when it comes to the rules. And certainly, a lot of times I talk to people who are newer in their faith or people who are not Christians. And oftentimes, the first thing they go to are all the rules in the Bible, and a lot of people get tripped up on it. And there's a couple of different camps about how we understand uh, what it means to be in relationship with God as it pertains to the rules. And Exodus shines an amazing light on what it means to be in relationship with God. There's some people that all they think about are the rules. They are the Pharisees. They are the police. They want to catch everybody doing everything. That's all they think about is what does God command. And their life is joyless. I have never met a person like that, and I used to be that, and I'm a recovering Pharisee. I've never met a person like that that actually has joy, that is actually uh, grateful for all that God has done. Now, there's a, a second group who never thinks about the rules, and they just kind of feel like God is cool and he'll forgive them on the last day, hopefully, but they just think that rules are stupid and they don't really have a place in a relationship with a loving God. Now, here's a couple of things that we'll see in the book of Exodus. All the rules in scripture 
never create a relationship with God. They are all confirmation of a relationship with him. Let me say that again. Rules are not a condition of a relationship. They are the, the confirmation of a relationship. In Exodus 20, where it starts the Ten Commandments, it says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. And then God goes on to give them the Ten Commandments. Do not worship any gods before me and many of these other uh, commandments and laws that we have heard. And here's what uh, we see in the book of Exodus. Rules are not a condition of a relationship with God. They don't create a relationship with God. They're confirmation of one. Now, my oldest son is getting to the age where we can establish some house rules in our household. And one of the big ones we've been working on recently is honesty. And what does it mean to be a, a, a rice man who tells the truth, even if it gets you in trouble? And uh, I tell them to repeat after me that why it's so important to tell the truth and how uh, the truth is always going to lead you to freedom. And he can repeat the things after me. And the reason we have rules are not to make him my son. He's my son, whether or not he lies. And he does lie a lot. The rules are a confirmation of a relationship, what it means to be in relationship with me, his, his father. Now, if he were to bring one of his friends to our house and that kid just told the truth nonstop, it doesn't make him my son. He's not my son just because he obeys my rules. Now, in one hand, a lot of times we just misunderstand um, and we feel like rules are the basis for a relationship, but they're not. They are the, the confirmation for it. And other times people feel like the rules are just stupid. All these laws, and some of them don't necessarily make a lot of sense to us. And we're going to get to even some of the, uh, the really uh, on the surface complicated and weird ones as well. I'm really excited to do that. But sometimes there are some things that God asks of you that just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean there's not a good reason for it. When I was in high school, I knocked a kid's tooth out. Uh, he was talking crazy, and I, no, I didn't actually. Uh, we were in gym class, and we were playing field hockey. That doesn't sound nearly as cool or uh, anything like that. But my gym teacher, you know, you know with this, uh, came out with the field hockey equipment and said, one rule when you're playing, never lift the hockey stick above your shoulders. Me, I was Wayne Gretzky Jr. and I was trying to score a goal, lifted the hockey stick as high as I could, felt it, hit something on my way back, shot and missed. Uh, I was never any good at it. And when I brought the stick down, I heard a loud yell and I looked at this kid, he was on the ground, blood coming from his mouth. I knocked one of his teeth out. He ended up having to get oral surgery to like fix his mouth. And he probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars and a whole lot of pain because I was an idiot. And just because I didn't see a good reason for a rule didn't mean that there wasn't actually a good reason for the rule. Now in our understanding of us, in our relationship to God, there's a lot of people who, in a lot of ways, if I'm being completely honest, you have made yourself the final arbiter of good and bad. And just because you can't see a reason for something in your life, how, how God called you to live, you've just dismissed it completely. Uh, but what it means to be in relationship with God is to accept him and his words, even if they don't always make sense to us. Now, the last theme that we're going to see in the book of Exodus, and this one is a one that is so powerful and so profound and one that Jesus built his life and his ministry on, is this theme of sacrifice. So number one, God keeps his promises. Number two, God offers true freedom. Number three, uh, how we can understand ourselves in relationship to God and rules. And number four, this concept of sacrifice. Now, this is something that you cannot get around when you get to the book of Exodus. And this is woven into the story of the people of God. Here's, this, here's how we are to understand sacrifice. We are redeemed. We are made right with God, not based on you and how good you are, but based on the sacrifice of another. And where we stand with God is not based on what you have done, but rather what has been done for us. And all throughout the book of Exodus, we see all of this, uh, these, these um, sacrifices that are made to make people right with God. And a couple of things about sacrifices. One, the sacrifices that you see in Exodus, they are all pointing to a greater reality in Jesus. One of my claims to fame is that on Thanksgiving at my house, I am in charge of not just the macaroni and cheese, but also the sweet potatoes. Now, I inherited the sweet potato duty uh, because those who are making it before me, I won't call out any names because my family watches this. The way it was being made was not up to par. And you can't skimp out on the sweet potatoes. That is actually, I would argue, the staple dish for every home on Thanksgiving. 
what was being made technically could be called sweet potatoes, but they were just chopped up potatoes and put some syrup on top. It was not the fully complete nutmeg brown sugar concoction that was intended for Thanksgiving consumption. Now, when you see these sacrifices all throughout the book of Exodus, they are meant to point to a fuller, greater, more appetizing reality. And this reality is a reality of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. That these sacrifices that we see in the book of Exodus point toward the true lamb who would be our sacrifice. Now, as for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we are called to remember this sacrifice of Jesus in an act called communion. As a matter of fact, it was the Passover night when Jesus was with his disciples and he changed the Passover meal for them that year. Surely, as growing up as Jewish men, they would have had a Passover cedars year after year, but this year it would be different. This year, Jesus would announce that he was the lamb. So if you have your communion material, for those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, I would invite you to take that out right now. If you don't have it, uh, you don't have to say hold up. You can just hit pause. And uh, when Jesus was having his last meal, also known as the Last Supper with his disciples, he talked about himself being the sacrifice, that it wasn't based off of what they were doing, but it was based off of himself being our sacrifice. Now, one of the most beautiful things about a sacrifice is that sacrifice is truly the best way to understand this concept of love because all real love is all sacrificial. That fake love, that Disney love, it's all about how you feel and how warm and cuddly and fuzzy you feel on the inside. But real love is about sacrifice. So Jesus reminded his disciples and also us of his sacrifice for us when he took the bread and he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, all of you. Then Jesus took a cup and he gave thanks. He says, take all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sins. Take and drink. Now Jesus tells his disciples and also us to do all of this in remembrance of him because the first thing that we are quick to forget is our need for a sacrifice. So as we have taken communion together, and for those of you who did not, I want to pray for us that it would seal into our hearts. So let me pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful that you keep your promises. I'm grateful that you give real freedom. I'm grateful that your rules are not arbitrary. And I'm grateful that you are our real true sacrifice, that you make a way for us to have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that today, even as we have taken communion together and prayed together and heard your words over our lives, that we would take that sacrifice to heart. Uh, that we would be grateful so much for your love for us and that that would be an invitation to deeper trust in you. So bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.